Thanks a lot, Christoph. Um, and also thanks to all the organizers. I think it's an amazing workshop and there were truly impressive talks today. Too bad we can't meet in person. Uh, so we decided to split the talk in two parts. First, Peter will give you some insights in how we realize product level uh, legged robots and how we commercially apply them today. And then I will do in the second part a bit of a deep dive, explain more of the, the research findings and challenges uh, from that perspective. So Peter, please go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone, and also welcome from my side. Uh, big pleasure to be here today. Really, the motivation, if you look at why we're building Lego robots uh, in industrial environments, because robotics has, you know, the potential to fundamentally change the way we do work, and a lot of applications already arrived. However, in industrials, there's a huge potential because these are vast physical assets complex to navigate and where we have the opportunity with legged robots to go into these environments and provide the local workforce with automation tools when we apply legged robots working with our customers it's mostly for three drivers that they're interested in it's about getting the information to maximize the equipment uptime and doing so while doing it safely making sure that people are not exposed to hazardous situations and second having the quality of a robotic inspection with the quality and quantity of a robotic sensing element. And lastly, using a robot as a routine inspection tools, making sure that you can do your routine inspection, gather the data in a cost efficient way. We apply this legged robotic inspection tool to a variety of industries. These range from the energy sector to oil and gas construction sites. It's everywhere where you have existing large facilities and a legged robot can go in as an advanced inspection tool and report on the state of equipment and infrastructure. In the following, I wanna give you a couple of examples from our work with our customers. On the left-hand side video, you see an example of two robots uh, with BSF, that's a large chemical complex, where it's about periodic condition monitoring. So having sensors on top of robot going around and collecting data. On top, very often you have situations where you have two people, one person in the control room and one outside, and they walk through, talk to through walkie-talkies. And here you have a, an eye and ears on site being able to remote control your operations. On the right-hand side, work with a partner Petronas where they installed the system on the offshore site. Here you have the difficulty of offshore. So imagine when climbing those stairs, you have a vast ocean uh, where none of your sensors can pick up anything and being able to localize and robustly in all weather conditions is really a challenge here. Two more examples that uh, are quite interesting. One is on rolling stock inspection, where here again, you're interested to do routine visual inspection for safety relevant vehicles here inside the train and outside the train uh, in the existing infrastructure. On top, they are interested also using now a robot outside of the depot where typically you wouldn't have access but with a machine, you can accelerate your inspection process and maintenance process. A last example, quite a common one is on construction site where it's about capturing the reality as it's being built. Here, robot has a unique opportunity because this infrastructure is just about to be built and digitizing these environments is extremely difficult. So it's about progress monitoring. Is it built according to plan? And also identifying any safety hazards that might occur during these constructions. We promise our customers essentially a better way to collect better data. And that's for mainly three reasons. One, because it's a scalable inspection solution. So instead of planting sensors everywhere, now we have machines that can go and carry multiple kilograms in high-end sensors um, without any special preparations. Second, it's about actionable insights. So not only collecting data, but understanding what's going on in the environment, identifying, classifying, and providing the operators with the insight that they need to run their plants efficiently and safely. And lastly, as mentioned before, it's about safety, reducing the exposure of your staff to hazardous environments. If you think of this promise, it's not only about a robot, a physical robot. We really think of it in three steps as an end-to-end -end robotic solution. Certainly it's on one side, an autonomous vehicle that can go anywhere in any environment. Step number two is about being able to perceive the environment, understand it. And lastly, what's very important is about the end-to-end -end integration with the operator's workflow. But today, since this is a robotics workshop, I want to focus only on this autonomous mobility in, in these types of environments. 
Let me in the following go through a couple of things that are important to our customers and how we can solve them with the mobility of four legs. If you imagine these environments are built for human navigation and here a robot with four legs is an ideal platform to provide fast, robust and extremely versatile navigation. These systems are able to go anywhere where humans can go on all surface and, and metal stairs um, or you sip, slippery stairs, metal greatest stairs, etc. So it's about being able to navigate in without any pre pre or changes in the environment. Of course, if you have a system walking, there could be a situation where it slips in difficult uh, installations. And here again, you don't want any physical interaction with the robot and need to provide the capability of the robot to self write. Since these are industrial environments, it's a lot about outdoors being robust. That's why we build robots that are IP67 water and dustproof and are ruggedized uh, for impacts. And also, if you imagine, uh, these systems have to work at night in harsh sunlight. So it's about day and night operations of your sensors. And also, if you do visual inspection, you need that active lighting to get um, comparable situations and, and an environment where you can pick up the data. The autonomy, that's one of the fundamentals to provide such a system. Here, we use the depth cameras around the robot and the LiDAR in the back and fuse the data in order to, for the robot to be able to navigate indoors at centimeter accuracy. We use a system called show and go, and I'll show you that in a second. But while doing so, of course, when you follow these routes that you programmed, you need to be able to pick up obstacles because these are envi dynamic environments, understand them, stop it, and, and navigate around them. The installation process, how we do that is there's two options. One is a process called show and go, when we essentially physically take the robot through the plant and use our SLAM process to create a highly accurate 3D map. And then within that map, we define the inspection point, what the robot's supposed to look at. We save all the waypoints and mission points and the robot is then free to optimize the path and how, to, how he thinks is the best way to fulfill these missions in the quickest way. Another recent option is to be able, if the, the customer has CAT or building information data available, that can, we can import this data through our gazebo simulator, number one, physically simulate the best way and how to achieve the mission, and then take the point cloud data and transfer from simulation to the reality and thereby massively accelerating this commissioning process. Autonomy consists not only of the, of the robot being able to autonomously navigate, but also being battery autonomous or energy autonomous. Here, it's very important to have a long battery lifetime uh, and an ability for the robot to automatically charge itself. So here we use these docking stations for the robot to automatically dock, or if you have extremely long uh, environments, for example, we have customers that have multiple kilometers of tunnels they want to inspect to extend the range of the robot, the robot being able to go one docking station, the next one essentially extend its range through that. Now, we recently introduced NMLD, our latest robot. I want to talk a little bit about what's the difference to previous generations and what did it take to build a certified industrial product. On a feature level, we mostly enhanced sensing of the platforms, adding, for example, six depth cameras to robot and also massively increased the, uh, the perception capabilities of the payload. This is where really data, the data flows in for the inspection tasks. So being able to be compatible with the environment here, we provide industrial grade Wi-Fi, also the option for 4G LTE. And then very importantly, it's about increasing the robustness from a prototype to product and also the efficiency. A lot of work has gone into the safety certification of the system. Today we're CE marked. And then very importantly, also, of course, the mass manufacturability and cost optimization since you're selling this as a product. Here we achieved um, with the still low volumes and optimization uh, with price reduction of 40%. And the following, I wanna go a little bit through what it took and able to achieve this. We talk about design for manufacturing, it's really three things that we did. Number one is about integrating components very tightly to simplify them. Uh, with, as an example, we integrated the leg motor combination much more than before able to reduce the number of parts and the complexity and thereby the cost. The second one, once you talk about mass manufacturing is about choosing the right manufacturing method. 
by selecting the right manufacturer method, be that uh, molded parts uh, or, the, or other techniques, it's so that you can profit, benefit from these economies of scale. For example, back in the days, our docking station consists of, of many pieces, 3D printed and metal pieces. And today we can, the main part is, is, is made out of one part molded out of one shape. And the last one, very important, is about the supply relations and reusing many of, many of the off-the-shelf components in your robot. By that, exploiting larger orders of volume. Um, for example, in our cabling, even though not all the cable lengths are optimized to the exact length, by choosing the same cable length, we're able to choose more of the same cables, thereby lowering the price when buying them. Testing. Uh, when you do that, design for reliability testing is a very important aspect. So here you see three examples that we did. It's about reliability in different temperature ranges, uh, thermal cycling, humidity. Um, you see here an example of this vibration shock table, making sure that all the components withstand the entire lifetime of the robot. Number two is about the compliance with electromatics and radios, about the mission immunity of the robot. And lastly, the environment where you have a robot going through water and dust, we check every single component and then also the entire system for UV radiation, corrosion, et cetera. Here's a couple of more examples on how then we in tested the entire system by, for example, dropping it at one meter on the water, having it run. Uh, you see on temperature chambers, uh, th these shaker tables and a lot of the drop tests to understand how to build the system to make it reliable. Of course, a lot of testing goes in into the software as well. Here's an example, the robot having 100% success rate to be able to stand up from various positions here in our lab. Who is Anybotics? We found a 2016 as a spin-off from ETH Zurich, uh, located here in, in Switzerland, where our core team has been developing robots for many, many years. Our, we last year raised the Series A VC funding round, uh, growing the team with a with the task, with the goal to commercialize this technology. And yes, our team is growing quickly, very interested in always the latest robotic experts and we're hiring. Let us know if you're interested and visit our website for the latest career options. Handing over to Marco for the research part. I wanna mention here our animal research community where it's all about advancing legged robots. Uh, join the number of researchers that already own a robot and work with our flexible API and open uh, software stack in order to enable them to do fantastic research. Thank you very much and handing over to Marco. Great, thanks Peter. Um... So just stop me if you can't see what you're supposed to be seeing. So let me start the second part with a small observation. This is now the fifth workshop that we have, which is called Two World, Three World Deployment of Legged Robots. And I think given the amazing progress that you have seen today in all these uh, presentations, we probably have to rename this uh, in the near future. Another paragon example in this area is like the, the DARPA challenge, uh, where we are challenge to have robotic systems can navigate autonomously in some of the most challenging environments on the ground, like tunnel system, urban on the ground, cave networks, and so on and so on. Now, DARPA does not request what type of robot it one needs to have, but I think it's interesting to see that the top five groups uh, from the tunnel circuit, what they're going to apply in the finals. So we see a lot of legged systems. Um, I will conclude that legged robots really definitely arrived in the real world. Now, if you want to deploy a legged robot in this type of environment, you need to make sure that you have very robust locomotion and also navigation over rough and flat environments. Um, let me dive a little deeper in the control that is required for that. So we have seen in many talks today how most uh, locomotion pipelines are built up. We have torque controlled robotic systems that are typically having some sort of a whole body controller or inverse dynamics controller on top of that. Then most people are using multi predictive uh, control methodologies. Uh, to like have a planner and controller in the same unit, uh, depending on uh, the groups. So you use templates or use more complex systems. And then on the very top, you have a human input or a navigation planner. I would like to take the opportunity here to dive a little deeper in what you are doing in this area. And also what we have seen today in, in many other talks, namely that there is a lot of perception included in the mean value in all these different areas. 
So we're gonna focus here on perceptive locomotion. How can we include feasible terrain patches as constraints in our controller? How can we do collision-free MPC? In the second part, we'll talk about environment and robot aware navigation. So how can we learn traversability and use that for navigation planning? And then in the last part, I'll give you a little bit of an outlook in how to make robots more agile and more versatile. We do different examples and two different robots. So one is about generating complex maneuvers uh, with a quadruped on wheels. And the last one is about unifying locomotion and manipulation to make our future robots to become actors. So let's start with the perceptive part. If you think about our environment, um, we typically are facing narrow passages. You may have overhanging structures that you have to duck and go underneath. That can be uh, dynamic obstacles in the way. Now in the way of Magnus, what we were doing was that we were mapping and modeling the environment using science distance fields then assigned collision models of spheres around the robot and formulated an MPC controller that takes this into account such that we are not colliding uh, with the environment. So we have an MPC controller uh, that includes a compound understanding of the environment with a static environment and dynamic environment, which is coming from a box block server that continuously maps the environment, as well as a, an obstacle tracker of dynamic obstacles that are moving around the robot. And we feed this in here. We then formulate the MPC controller, and there is nothing special to that. So the standard MPC that they're using in many other formulations, so you're optimizing certain cost functions, subject to the model dynamics, some friction cone constraints, and effective velocity constraints. If you're interested in more details, um, the most standard framework we're using for this is the OCS2 um, framework, uh, we're going to have an RSS workshop this year where Farbot is going to explain in very detail, also with hands-on examples, uh, how this can be used. Now, what is special, if you want to make this collision-free, you have to add additional um, augmentation in the cost function. So what we're doing here, we're adding cost function terms that are um, modeled as uh, quadratic barrier functions where we include the distances between these individual spheres and the environment such that the robot is pulled away uh, from these uh, potential collisions with the environment. And interestingly with this, we can still formulate the same MPC controller with only increasing the computation time by a slightly bit and have now a system that can very safely navigate in an environment uh, without colliding with it. So you can just give directional commands without having a complex navigation planner on top and have the robot navigate with it. Now, all of that only deals with the main body in collisions. We don't look at the terrain yet. The second work I would like to highlight here uh, is a work by Ruben, also presented here at the ACRA, where we essentially took uh, a segmentation of the terrain and formulate this as terrain constraint, both in the MPC layer as first order control barrier functions, but also on the whole body control layer. This was a joint work that we were doing uh, with the group of Aaron Ames at Caltech. And you see how the robot is now able to walk across stepping stones that are mapped. We're taking these segments where the robot can step on. We shrink them to smaller surfaces that have some uh, stability margin. And now with this formulation, we have a way how we can get essentially an ensured safety by locomoting over environments where we have only uh, selective patches where the robot can step upon. Now with this, we have a locomotion controller at hand. Um, in order to make this move in unknown environments, we have to additionally uh, add something on top of that, which is the navigation planner. There's two things we'd like to uh, let in here. First of all, if you want to find uh, the right local path, you have to first figure out where can I actually walk through. So you need some sort of a traversability estimation. Uh, classically, this is done that you take your map of the environment and you have then uh, some cost function filters, for example, slopiness, roughness, step height, that you turn this map of the environment into a traversability map and use this traversability map then in order to find the best path to navigate from A to B. It turns out that depending on the locomotion, it's actually pretty hard to hand tune all these individual filters. So Lawrence has come up with a method that use human intuition in order to do that. So we can steer robots very well. We can tell them, well, this is the direction you can go, this not. We could also tell the robot pretty well uh, where it should step and where not. So what you're doing is you're taking some images, depth images of the environment, and essentially human label then on top of that areas where the robot should not step and where it can step. 
and train from that filter kernels that allow us to, traver to transform an elevation map into a traversability map. In the second step, to use then this traversability map in order to plan how the robot is supposed to navigate in its environment. And we use for this so-called reachability-based planner. So there's two aspects to that. The first one is that we're modeling a collision box around the main body, and we're telling that this collision box is not supposed to collide with its environment. The second part is that we have a reachability box around each individual foot, and these reachability boxes have to be within feasible terrains. And by that, we can then generate potential navigation paths. What we're losing here is um, a lazy PRM method, uh, which allows us to essentially uh, continue to sample the vertices in the background for all the possible goal directions. And then once you query a new goal location, you have all the costs already assigned to these individual vertices, and you can only uh, search for the quickest one and uh, plan your navigation path to go there. So that can execute in like a few tens of milliseconds on the actual system. However, this still involves a human labeling step, and we want to generalize this uh, in the near future. So an approach that we investigated with Bowen was that we essentially learned this. Um, what we are doing, if you're looking at the terrain in order to figure out whether we can traverse it or not, is that we look at the local terrain information. We extract certain features, and then given a goal command, go in a certain direction, plus these local features, we can estimate how much energy we're using, how much time it takes, and what is the risk of failure. Now, what you want to do is to generalize this approach. So what we did is like set up simulation environments where we can randomize the environment quite massively, also the goal directions, and then learn this feature extraction and uh, cost prediction in simulation. Now, when you have this during execution, all you need to have is you take a global map, and then you can sample given certain directional commands, what is my cost to, mo to go there? And I can set up a, a roadmap with individual vertices given certain costs and use this for sampling-based planners. You can, on top of that, also uh, like iteratively optimize that using gradient-based optimizers. If you're interested in more details in that, there's a nice talk by Bowen uh, that happened here at Dicro this week. Now, given these frameworks, this allows us now to autonomously navigate in the closed environment of a robot. So given setting a new target location and the robot will automatically go there. I see also how the robot maps in life its environment. This is the elevation map. We set the new target location and pretty much immediately the new path is calculated in order to make it reliably navigating there without colliding with any of these obstacles and using paths which are actually traversable for the machine. Now, with this, we have local planners at hand, which are essentially the basis of what we're using also during this uh, DARPA competition, which I introduced at the very beginning. So what remains until the finals in September is that we are doing a lot of tests. So we're bringing our robots pretty much on a weekly basis to all kinds of different fields where we train both locomotion and navigation uh, in urban environments, with, like steep stairs, where we also uh, like occlude some of the perception. We go through uh, very rough terrain, rough environments, muddy grounds and things like that to really uh, challenge uh, the whole system um, at different levels. Now the last part I want to introduce here was or give you here is a bit of an outlook in how this can continue in the near future. What you want to achieve is more than just locomotion. You want to make our machines a lot more agile, a lot more versatile. And I'll show you two examples in how we can do this, one with an animal on wheel and the other one uh, with a mobile manipulation system. Now imagine the following problem. You have a robot that should overcome in a dynamic fashion certain terrain in front of us. What we have illustrated already before was how we can do inverse dynamics and this online motion planning, so the MPC stack. Now what you do on top of that is that we have come up with like an offline motion planning algorithm that is more than just like a very simplified model and uh, figuring out what is feasible or not, but really taking into account the complex dynamic of the system and optimizing where to step, when to step, given certain uh, elevation of the environment, a certain goal location. Now, this takes time. This is not something that we can do today in real time. So that's why you're doing this offline. It can take maybe a couple of hundred milliseconds. And then what you do is you generate motion libraries from that. And then when you're executing this online, all you have to do is essentially group this 
in virtual motions that we're having and compose complete trajectories from that. So this is how it looks like. So given start in the go location, uh, we then do the offline trajectory optimization, which takes a couple of hundreds of milliseconds to plan the path and also uh, how the like in virtual timings and photo locations look like. We then have the execution of it. We run an MPC controller while executing it. And this MPC controller essentially takes in the cost function a tracking term that we replicate the behavior we're planning, but also includes um, like the, the actuator commands uh, as, a, as a cost plan. Uh, with this together, uh, we are able to execute uh, very complex uh, maneuvers composed of different types. Uh, of individual maneuvers, getting across obstacles in a dynamic fashion, also multiples of them that they are combined. So here you see like driving underneath the table, turning and ducking at the same time. Now, the last part I want to talk about here is legged robot as actors. We have seen this also today in, in several other talks already. I think this is where like robotics is moving. We don't wanna have pure observers. You wanna have machines that observe and act in the environment, opening doors, um, executing certain tasks, uh, doing maintenance works, and so on and so forth. So we've been developing over the last um, two and a half years a couple of uh, robotic arms that are integrated on our animal. But most importantly, what we want to achieve is a unified multi-contact optimal control problem for locomotion and manipulation unified in one uh, controller. Contact making and breaking is encoded here as a switch system framework. We are using full central dynamics. And I think this is really an important aspect. We want to uh, figure out what is the influence of our arm on the complete system dynamics, also of the model of the environment on our system dynamics. And lastly, we are formulating cost functions, both robocentric and object centric, that we can have systems that move around and interact or have like the task described in a, in a task. Again, same tools as before. If you want to see details, there's two papers by Jean-Pierre uh, Vizicra. What can you achieve with that? So here are a couple of simulation results. It's interesting here, for example, a pushing task where we have joint torque limits and you see how the robot slows down, how it stretches the arms, and it looks really like a natural behavior and how we're pushing around heavy obstacles. You can also do dynamic uh, tasks, like throwing tasks, dynamic load pushing tasks. We then took this and brought this on the, the real system. You see here object pickup of masses that we don't know at the time you're picking it up. Then we're measuring it and uh, we integrate this into the model. We can carry along uh, these uh, picked objects. Uh, we do interactions with doors. So you see here um, pull doors, push doors with variable stiffnesses and uh, damping. At the time we have certain perception integrated, but uh, these uh, examples that you see here are pre-controlled by humans uh, to, to grasp the handle. And you see also how dynamic this is, so the human interacts with the door and the robot still continues to operate. And lastly, of course, also like if you have maintenance works uh, that are very often happening uh, in, in some of the industries that Anibotics is working on, you have now the ability to really conduct this in the real world. With this, I'm also concluding the scientific part of this talk, and uh, Peter and myself are opening up for the Q&A session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for your very, very uh, dense presentation and so many uh, new ideas. Um, we have a question from the chat. So one of the questions is from Mike. So if you had a demo tomorrow at, in your lab where non roboticists move animal around with the joystick and perhaps kick it about a bit would you prefer the full body highly non-linear 550 uh, 50 hertz mpc controller running or a lip based mpc running and 200 hertz so we are very confident about uh, this full body mpc control it's not something that is very fragile so for this type of demonstrations I uh, have no problems at all to have somebody playing around with that. Uh, I think it's getting a little more tricky once you have very challenging environments, uh, also once you're including all the perception that. So that's where we are at the limits at the moment, but this is uh, about to come. Perfect, thank you very much. And we have a second question. It is from Nathan Boyd. 
Can you comment on how you see learning methods could scale to locomotion manipulation tasks? So there's that there's different ways in how we're approaching this. Uh, we have done some RL work on locomotion that you may have seen. Uh, of course, you can extend the same thing also for locomotion and manipulation. We actually do combinations of model-based manipulation with learning-based locomotion. That's one direction we're moving. The other one is really to combine uh, 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 reinforcement learning both for manipulation and locomotion. What you can always do is also what you have seen in many presentations today, that uh, some of the aspects of like how to plan, when to grasp, where to grasp, like these high-level tasks, uh, to use this in a, in a learn flash fashion, and then to have a uh, model-based controller for locomotion manipulation. Okay. 